Casey, are you there? I am here. Surely good. All right, so first order of business. We had the audio loopback problem last week, so I'm just looking at my faders. It really doesn't look like we had that problem again, um, but if anyone watching um, is seeing or hearing audio problems, um, just uh, shout ASAP in the chat and, and we'll look into that, but I'm hopeful that we've, I'm hopeful that we've cracked that. Um, so you're not where you normally are. Um, whereabouts are you, Casey? I am down uh, in Southern California at an Airbnb just outside of Joshua Tree this week. Very nice. Um, that sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, cool. it's pretty, pretty great. This I'm, time of year especially, it's nice and cool. Yeah, I'm still in Burgess Hill, which is, um, yeah, I suppose I could, I could pretend Burgess Hill is anything you like, but it's, yeah, it's just a <laughs> generic commu commuter town, so you've definitely won in, in that competition. Um, cool. So um, welcome to Calico Live, everyone. This is episode eight. Um, I'll just introduce the session as usual. Um, Calico Live is an occasional informal live video stream series. And uh, the idea is that it's an opportunity to check in with us in a more uh, kind of relaxed setting um, than, than we usually have and, uh, and not in a heavily scripted way. So we kind of err on the side of having a very just a very loose script so that we kind of can explore and take the time to explore things that are interesting to us and also answer any questions that come in. Um, up until episode five, we talked a lot about the eBPF data plane. And if you're interested in that, you should probably go back to those. Um, then we had a uh, special with um, um, uh, the, uh, the Calico Life um, birthday special. And episode seven, uh, Casey joined us and um, and, and he's here again with episode eight this week. We're, we're doing an eBPF data plane, uh, sorry, a IP tables uh, data plane uh, packet walk. Um, so with that excellently smooth delivery, um, let's get started. Um, so to introduce myself first, I'm um, Chris Tompkins. I'm a developer advocate at uh, Tigera. Um, I kind of champion user needs and try to support our contributor and user community. I've been in networking since 2000 or so, and uh, I'm interested in kind of SDN and that drew me to Calico. Um, Casey, did you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Casey. I am uh, one of the engineers that uh, works on the, the core Calico development team. I've been doing it for uh, quite a few years now. I think this is coming up on my sixth year working on Calico. Um, and I've been doing software and networking type stuff since about 2013. Fantastic. Awesome. Um, all right. So we the published um, targets for this session, uh, we said that we would um, do an IP tables data plane uh, packet walk, which my thinking behind that was that we, we spoke a lot about the EBPF data plane and the strengths of it. Um, but the IP tables data plane is still the right tool in, in many circumstances. Um, so I thought that we would, while we have access to your, um, you know, kind of uh, expert knowledge, um, we would kind of dive a bit deeper into that. Um, but before we get into that, I thought we could take a little bit of time just to chat about 3.21 um, and the progress on that. Um, so can you just give us a quick update on the status of 3.21? Yeah, sure. Um, so 3.21 is in the final stages at the moment. Um, we're going through final validation, bug fixing, and testing. Um, uh, we cut release branches I think early last week, and I've just been stabilizing those since. Fantastic. Um, we're cur currently looking at a release date probably of this coming Monday, which I think is the 8th uh, of November. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so home stretch. Nice. Fantastic. Well done. Is it, uh, is it killing you working on it on a, on, on a, without, without lots of screens, or is it not too much of a problem for you? Without lots of screens as in... Oh, sorry, because you're, cause you're traveling. I'm assuming that you're on your... I've got a pretty large screen. I actually brought my desktop with me. Oh, kind um, of. Yeah, that's probably what worthwhile thing to so do. So it, it's, uh, it's not so bad. Yeah. I will say this chair is a little bit lower than <laughs> at home. It's yeah. not quite as comfy. Yeah, I thought you just hadn't been eating your vegetables. Um, <laughs> great. Okay, cool. And uh, just on the on 321 a little bit more, um, what are the main changes? Uh, yeah, so um, some improvements on uh, the service work that we did in 3.20, so um, adding Windows support for the service network policy rules, which um, we talked a bit about mm -hmm. uh, on the last Calico Live, mm -hmm. um, as well as support for ingress rules. 
um, that reference Kubernetes services. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, I think that'll be be quite useful. Um, we've also got some improvements uh, for folks that are using BGP to, to kind of interconnect with um, their own routers and stuff. So uh, is that authentication stuff? Um, no, we've so we've got uh, we're talking about BGP password capabilities. Mm -hmm. That's that's already been in Calico for a while. I don't know when that was added, but um, we've uh, adding a little bit more fine grained control on which um, prefixes are advertised and which aren't. Right. So um, ability to kind of toggle on and off advertisement for different pools, uh, IP pools in the cluster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, that's going to be handy. Um, yeah. If the well, just while we're on the topic of, of BGP, there, there's more than one way to set that up. Um, and I did a session about, I guess it was about four or five months ago now, time flies, um, just about the kind of the more recommended topologies uh, for that. So if anyone is kind of interested in that stuff, that's a, 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 well, I'm blowing my own trumpet, but it's a worth, worthwhile session, I think, because there are, there are definitely many ways to get that working that aren't optimal. Um, so, so that session is quite useful, I think. Um, cool. All right. That's uh, really good, Casey. Thank you. Um, so I should just take the opportunity to say, I always try to remember to say, um, if anyone has questions, um, we're really happy to be derailed um, at any point. We, we can always come back to this stuff. Um, so if you want to drill into anything, uh, please just um, just put a, a comment in the chat and, and we'll, we'll jump on it. Um, and if, if it's not something we can answer, then we're, we're always fine to take it offline and, and get the answer and come back to you. Um, so with that said, let's dive into the main um, the main point uh, today, which was to um, do an IP table uh, database main packet walk. So I, I've already alluded to why I thought that was a good idea. Um, you've got expert knowledge, and um, not only do you have a deep understanding that you can share with us, but also I thought that if we do this in a relatively live way, uh, as we intend, rather than using a recording or anything like that, um, then we get to see kind of your thought process a little bit, um, which can be you know can be as useful as the actual commands themselves sometimes in my experience um so so this is yeah um this is intentionally intentionally us figuring it out as we go a little bit um rather than just delivering a recording so i hope that's appreciated um and so the reasons why why ip tables why the ip tables data plane you know it's is still we've been talking a lot about the, the strength of the ebpf data plane but the reason the IP tables data plane is still relevant, I mean, it's what, what it, one of the big ones is that it's battle tested and that that it's code that has been running for a long time on a lot of live clusters, an incredible number of live clusters, an incredible number of live nodes. I'm always kind of a bit shocked when I'm reminded of how big that number is. Um, but, but you know, there's a lot of confidence in, in delivering code that's really trusted. So battle tested, and obviously there's the kernel requirement or the lack of it. Um, you don't need to support, uh, you don't need support uh, EBPF in your kernel. Um, so older clusters or clusters that for whatever reason aren't running um, an EBPF capable, capable kernel. And um, heterogeneous environments, I love that word. Um, so, you know, we all like to talk about the latest shiny thing, but the reality is sometimes, you know, you, you, for one reason or another, you have a cluster that has to remain a bit out of date, be that in terms of hardware or, or whatever. Um, and the IP tables data plane will continue to support those as long as they meet the, you know, the requirements for it. But the one that, that is close to my heart in a way as well is that, um, having been with Tigera for, for a year and, and learning about Calico, um, the other thing that's great about the IP tables data plane is that you can troubleshoot it using a traditional let eng skill set. And we'll see some of that today. You know, these are, a lot of these commands have been unchanged for a long time. Um, and there's some of the strength, some of the original success of Calico can probably be attributed to the fact that these are the tools and made sense and were comprehensible. I think we've talked about this before, but you know, comprehensible tool set that, um, that is familiar and and trusted. Um, so, so uh, we'll see some of that today. Was there anything else you wanted to say on any of those points before we dive in a bit? No, I, I was I was just actually thinking. Uh, I was hoping you were going to say that last bit because that's the one that rings true. I think for a lot of people is just familiarity. Um, you know, it it for 
throwing out a random number, 80% or more, like the <clears throat> the performance capabilities are more than enough for um, for most users in mm -hmm. moderate to large scale clusters even. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see a little bit of this, but you know we've taken quite a bit of care to ensure we're using IP tables in a performant way mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and leveraging things like IP sets to, to improve that. Um, but yeah, just being able to dive in with tools that you already know and uh, and that you're already using in other parts of your your workflow for yeah. And on the eighty percent point, I think you could I think you could give a, a capable Linux slash network engineer access to an IP tables data plane cluster, and they could have a pretty good go at figuring out what was going on without any background knowledge. Um, oh, yeah. They might, you know, they might not get the, every nuance, but they would. They could figure out where the traffic was going and why it was going there. Um, EBPF, not so much. Um, you know, the, once you know the tools, then then it, then it's possible. But yeah, it's it's complex. Um, yeah. Cool. All right, brilliant. So let me uh, just introduce what I've actually built for you. Um, it's a little bit of a synthetic environment, but um, but it does the trick. So let me just share my screen. Um, Let's try that one, see how that works. I'll put that on top for now and see how we get on with that. Um, so hopefully people are seeing my screen. They certainly should be. Um, so I've got some docs that we may come back to if we need them, but but the main thing is, is this terminal window here. And so I've got a cluster. Um, so where should I start with this? It's running in, in GCP, Google Cloud, and uh, it's a five node cluster. Um, uh, one control plane node and uh, three um, three non control plane nodes. Um, so, in terms of what pods are actually running on it, that doesn't add up. Yeah, I know. Sorry, there's <laughs> there's there's the infrastructure infrastructure node as well that um, that Bunzai likes to put in there. Um, yep. So, um, so I'm just showing you what's in the default namespace at the moment but you've got the, the Google Microsoffice demo, otherwise known as the online boutique demo, which has had an update actually. It's had a, it's had a reskin, um, which surprised me. Uh, it actually looks different to how it did uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so that's running there, but as it turns out, I ended up not leaning so heavily on that. So actually this demo could have used something else, but it, as it happens, it's running there. Um, this is all in the default namespace. And then there are two um, Ubuntu pods, uh, which are just vanilla Ubuntu. Um, and their IP addresses are identical. Everything's identical about them, except their IP addresses are one, uh, one different, well, one bit different. Um, so, in the um, other namespaces, um, you can see this is this cluster was deployed with Tiger Operator, and um, it's running the API server. It's not running the eBPF data plane. It's running the IP tables data plane. Um, so in terms of what policies are actually implemented there, um, uh, we've got three network sets. Um, there's an IP allow set um, and the IP allow set uh, contains the IP address of one of the two Ubuntu um, pods that I mentioned, but not the other one. Um, so that's going to be used to allow some traffic later. And then there's two IP deny sets and they contain, um, I made an arbitrary choice to uh, deny some traffic to in the internet. So I chose um, 1.0.0.1 1 .1 and 1.1.1.1, which are the two um, um, resolvers of uh, the 1.1.1.1 um, DNS service. Um, so, in the way that I've actually implemented those, then I've gone ahead and created some um, healthcare network policies. Um, so I'll just go over these one at a time quickly to say what they do at a high level. Oops, that's not what I wanted. I wanted that. There we go. So um, the lowest ordered um, policies come first. So policy 1551, they uh, are service based policies which allow egress um, from any pod um, in the default namespace to kube API and kube DNS. Um, then the next one is this order 100. That denies uh, TCP 
to 1.1.1.1. Uh, sorry, TCP DNS to 1.1.1.1. And then the same for UDP DNS. Um, and then everything is denied to 1.0.0.1. So the objective here was to show um, egress being blocked to specific ports. And this one shows egress being blocked to an entire um, IP. Uh, then there are two ingress um, policies which block uh, just specifically to the front end. Um, one allows uh, one of the two Ubuntu pods based on that allow set that I showed, and then everyone else is denied. So if I just show that working really quickly, if I jump over here, um, if I use kubectl exec to jump onto the Ubuntu pod that has the last uh, least significant part of its name starting with Z, this is the one that is allowed to, so it can curl this service. And I should show that service before I move on. So there is a service called Frontend, um, which has a cluster IP 10.103.66.216, and it answers on port 80. So if I go back over here again and I curl that, sure enough, um, it works just fine from this uh, Ubuntu pod. But the other one with the other IP address, same thing. Uh, and it's blocked. Uh, so that will just time out as intended. And then to show the other part of this, uh, the the traffic going out to 1.0.0.1. So if I uh, use dig to hit, um, just remind myself which one is which. Yeah, that's right. So if we go to 1.1.1.1, which is a public internet uh, DNS resolver, and try and look up example.com, it fails because that's blocked, but I can hit the same server, uh, sorry, I can hit the same server on HTTP and that works just fine. So that's because I'm blocking, specifically blocking DNS to 1.1.1.1, but I'm allowing everything else. Uh, and then for 1.0.0.1, starting to regret choosing ones that are so quite so fun to say, um, then you find that not only is DNS blocked, but also HTTP and everything else is blocked. Um, so did I miss anything on that explanation, Casey, of what broadly what, what we're looking at? Uh, I think that all made sense to me. Yeah, okay, great. Um, um, so I think, so the main key takeaways, I suppose, is every, everything's in the default namespace. Uh, it's all implemented as Calico network policy. Um, there's no global network policy in this case, and we're using network sets. Cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So mostly egress policies. So we're going to want to look at the nodes hosting those. Yes, exactly. Uh, Nginx pods. Yeah. So I thought. Pods. So um, if I give you control in a sec, um, I thought we could first of all look at the egress. Uh, the the uh, dig into how the egress is actually uh, the egress and ports policies are working. So that's looking at the the egress to 1.0.0.1 and 1.1.1.1. Um, so it keeps saying that fast and it gets even worse. Um, so if I just pull up this diagram quickly from our documentation, this this is an intentionally, um, you know, really simplistic diagram to just kind of capture the really basic stuff, but we're just gonna have a look at the, the host routing um, and the IP tables um, on the source node. Um, so I'll leave you to show how we can discover which node that is and so on. Um, okay, if I pass over to you now. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, I did just have a realization as you showed that diagram. There mm. was another diagram I wanted to show. Oh, great, it, okay. Um, uh, I can pull it up in my browser. Uh, why don't I pull that up in my browser? Because you're, yeah, as you, as you were going to say, you're just sharing one window, aren't you? Yeah. Um, I'll link that to you. Great. On... Actually, I can send it in. Is Zoom chat if I can find it? <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah, I'll just send it to you over Slack. And yeah, I'm, okay. Now that I've got I recently upgraded to three screens and I've got managed to get everything on, I've got everything here, here somewhere if I can just find it. So yeah, either way should be fine with me. Um, I'll take this opportunity while we're just doing this to just to say um, as you know reminder that now is just as good a time as any to take questions if anyone has anything. Um, so please feel free to chip in. I'm not seeing a message from you though, Casey. Oh, Sorry, there, yeah, I had it's to just reopen Slack and it was right. taking its time. Yeah, that's cool. Um, this is 
I mean, this is just a really old blog post, but I still look back at it every once in a while because about halfway down the page, it's got a really nice, um, not that one, but the, the next one, yeah. Really nice diagram um, and some explanation around the IP tables packet path. Um, so yeah, I, I totally have this bookmarked and review this whenever I need to to look into this. Um, you can kind of take any two um, source and destination, say, you know, pod to local interface mm -hmm. or pod to pod and follow exactly which tables and chains um, the packet's going to traverse. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, then, I actually read the read this article this morning to refresh my memory myself. Um, but yeah, it's a really nice diagram, isn't it? Actually, it's not a bad article at all. Yeah, I actually, I we should uh, we should probably throw that in our docs because it's definitely still relevant and I think more useful than the the one that's currently there. But um, those little um, numbers there refer to um, in the in the text a little bit below, it shows exactly which type of policy is implemented in each place. Um, so thought that would be handy to have as a, as a reference as we go. Yeah, through. so I'll tell you what, what we'll do is I'll keep that on my screen and then I can very easily just quickly flick over without you having to pull up anything. So if you want to cross-reference to that diagram, just shout and, I'll, and I can flick over in theory. Let's see if I can. All right, so I'm gonna switch to your screen now. Um, which I think would pop ourselves to the back a bit so we can see. Yeah. Okay, good. So yeah, we're seeing your screen. Cool. Um, so I'm just going to start by finding out, um, we want to check out the policy that's being applied to our Ubuntu pods here. Um, so I'm just getting the pod and finding out what node it's on so I can head over there to, uh, to take a look. Perfect. So it looks like they're both on node two. Um, which is where I'm going to SSH. And I am in. So first thing I'm going to do, I, uh, I was telling you earlier, Chris, I don't even think I ever really learned the normal IP tables <laughs> command output. I just went straight to IP table save because it's substantially easier to parse in my opinion. So. Um, yeah. Now on that point, um, I think the other thing that's worth saying about IP table save is that it doesn't save anything because um, it intuitively, yeah. if you do, if you knew nothing about it, you would assume that it wrote config to disk or something, but it doesn't. It just spits it out to stood out. Um, yeah. So so yeah, that's worth knowing. Um, but it spits it out in, as you said, in a more readable way. Yeah. I like to pass the uh, dash c option because it gives you packet and byte counts for the different rules. Nice. Um, which probably don't need here if I'm going to do anyway, because it's um, kind of helpful to see which rules are being hit and which mm -hmm. aren't. Um, I'm just going to stick it into a file so we can take a look at it. Um, cool. So this is everything. There's a whole bunch of stuff here. Um, the traffic we were looking at was egress from a pod. So um, you look at that diagram we're just looking at, the very first thing it does is go through um, the pre-routing uh, rules. So if we look for um, what's in pre-routing, you're going to see mm -hmm. at the very top of all of these, it jumps to uh, Kali pre-routing, which is the um, chain that the Calico sticks all of its pre-routing rules in. Okay. So we can just skip right to that. I'm just going to search through here. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff in Kali pre-routing. Um, sorry, I want to get to the right place, not raw. Maybe That's I'll... fine. Take your time. I'm just wondering if we should pull up that diagram just quickly and pull up the and spec and kind of highlight the exact ch chain oh, of yeah, flow that we are looking at. Um, that might be good, be good to do for both of us. All right, so let's do that now. Um, I'm gonna have to move that window over there. Unfortunately, it's not quite as smooth as it could be because of uh, me juggling screens. Three screens isn't enough. I need five or six. Um, 
Right, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so the case that we're looking at is a pod. Yeah, so, so we're looking at a pod to um, something, I mean, in this case, it's outside the cluster, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's gonna go through this pod um, forward post routing mm -hmm. chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that um, makes sense. Network interface. Um, in our particular case, if you if you were to look at um, what four is in that mangle table, mm -hmm. um, I think that's uh, untracked policy, which is is not something we're using here. So mm -hmm. we shouldn't expect to see any rules in pre routing as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, most of what we're doing is going to be in the forward uh, filter mm -hmm. chain. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to, to show kind of how we hook in. Uh, and most of these, they'll be the main chain, um, pre-routing, forward, et cetera. And then we'll hook in our Kali equivalent to that right at the top. Um, Perfect. I wonder so about making a new version of this diagram that actually yes. contains the commands to view the the relevant um, chains as well. Oh, yeah, that would be cool. That would be cool, wouldn't it? Um, all right, I might take that offline and do that later. Uh, so I'm jumping back to your screen now. Yeah, so I mean, the main thing to see here, I guess, in, in pre routing is that there's not a ton going on. Um, we do have this rule that um, immediately accepts packets that we've already uh, allowed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's the CT state, con connection tracking state. Yeah. yeah. Right there. Mm -hmm. um, so if we go and look at forward. Uh, you'll see once again, right at the top, you've got this jump to Cali forward. Yeah, makes sense. Um, oops. Case sensitive. Um, make sure we're looking at the right stuff. Um, yeah, so this is this is where we start getting to the interesting rules that we care about here. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have any host endpoints. So this rule is not, um, it's actually not going to be anything in this jump. So I'm going to skip over it. Okay. Um, we uh, start off by clearing some marks. We use marks for throughout this to um, do various things. We have a mark bit that's used for um, indicating that uh, a connection should be allowed. Um, we have mark bits indicating that a connection should bypass the remaining policies in uh, in that kind of chain. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got uh, some scratch space mark bits that we use for um, kind of passing intermediate uh, data or states between. Um, different rules. Is that is that is the namespace for those marks something that we share with other tools? Um, and if so, how do we uh, how do we know our marks are are not interpreted by other things? Is is it is it a case of just people use a bit of space that no one else is using, or is there something more formal than that? It's no, there's there's nothing really more formal than that. It's it's definitely a shared space. Um, there are a bunch of bits we try to use not so many of them. Mm -hmm. um, and we have config options in case this ever needs to be changed. Yeah, great. But um, in general, I haven't seen it conflicting much. Mm -hmm. I think the only real uh, common other user of IP tables in most clusters would be cube proxy, mm -hmm. which yeah. we specifically chose mark bits that don't interfere with yeah, what, uh, <laughs> yeah. cube proxy uses. That's probably a good call, yeah. <laughs> Um, that was sort of an easy decision. Uh, so yeah, we, we just use um, these top four. Uh, we'll see a little bit more about that later. Um, so the, the main ones that we're interested here, um, Calico attaches all of its policies specifically to the Kali interfaces. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we know which policy chains to run through mm -hmm. for a particular workload. So we've got these two dispatch chains here um, for uh, packets that are coming in from a Kali interface. So this is 
uh, from workloads. That's what this from WL means. Mm -hmm. um, and then going out is to workloads. So the um, the policy we're looking at here was all egress policy, which means it's going to be coming in from a Kali interface. And this mm -hmm. little Kali plus means use the Kali prefix. Right. Um, so we're going to hop in and follow this from workload dispatch chain and see what's in there. Perfect. Yeah, OK, that all makes sense. Um, so I'm just going to separate out all of these so that it's a little block there. Yeah, um, I wish this was I wish this was um, columnized or tabulated yeah. or whatever the correct word is. It would just make it be make it so much easier. Um, when I was doing yeah, one of sure. one of the courses, I found that there is a command line tool that that takes things and tries to column uh, put them in columns, um, which does have some make, make IP tables a little bit more readable, but still not that helpful. Yeah, it, uh, I'm sure there's probably some uh, series of commands you can pipe this output through to get it a little bit more readable, but this is what you get um, yeah. out of the box, and it's not too terrible. It would just be nice if like this was there. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's surprising how even just doing that makes it instantly yeah. <laughs> work on the eye more easily. Um, yeah, so so this is our Kali from workload. Now I my OCD is kicking in. And I, this, so. <laughs> I just I've accidentally just uh, accounted for the next half hour of your time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can see uh, we've got all these from workload dispatch um, rules here, and. Uh, each one is for a particular Kali interface. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if you if I just uh, hide that really quick. Yeah, I was going to say that. I was going to suggest this a minute ago, yeah. Uh, look at the interfaces on the host. Brilliant. You'll see we've got, uh, looks like, four Calico pods, mm -hmm. Calico networked pods running here. Uh, and they each get their own interface uh, prefix of Kali. So you've got like D6FC and CB3B and other D and this guy. Um, so it's uh, it's fun that both of these are uh, start with D here because it gets us to see a little bit um, more about how Calico can optimize some of these sometimes. Um, so oh, that's if it cool. spots, mm -hmm. yeah, if we spot um, prefixes in the generated mm -hmm. um, interface names for the different pods, we will kind of build a tree structure out of it to limit the length of the number of rules that are created. That's fantastic. I actually didn't know that was a thing. I mean, I knew that there were optimizations, but I, I hadn't seen that particular one. Yeah, this is uh, this is one I actually forget about because you don't always see it. It depends on what the yeah the interfaces generated yeah, are. Handy. Um, um, do you want to show quickly how we know which interface is which pod? Yes. Um, or do you think that so, best comes later? Whatever. You well, think. so so Calico knows that because of the it's in the data model. Mm -hmm. um, these interfaces are actually um, kind of procedurally generated by Calico based on pod identifying information. So in the code, given a pod, you can reconstruct the interface that it's going to use. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't know um, that either. Um, I assumed it was it was just recorded once it was created. Do you remember, it, it's a bit of a nasty one to put you on the spot, do you remember what plays into that number, uh, into that um, name? I presume pod name, presumably, pod name would be? Yeah, I think it's, it's the pod identifying information. Um, I don't I think it's pod name and namespace. Yeah. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I, I don't know the exact algorithm. Off that's the top totally, of my that's head, totally but, fine and reasonable. Um, there's a little bit of code that's shared around to do that. And um, I mean, that's that's nice because it doesn't require information. Mm -hmm. It doesn't require like storing this and sharing that around. You can, you know, everybody every all the different components know the pod and so from there they can figure out the interface mm -hmm. um, yeah. i think we we did that switch when 
like early on in Calico's life, this was information that was like written into etcd and then other components had to read. Um, this is a simplification that came when we switched to using the, the Kubernetes data store. Mm -hmm. um, so what you're saying is so, I need to spend some time finding a pod name and namespace name that results in a funny, funny Kali interface or, you know, the human readable absolutely. Kali interface. I think that's time well spent. I would love to see that. Yeah. Cool. All right. I'll work on that. Um, all right. So where do we go next? So, yeah. Um, I mean, the way that I usually figure out who is who here, um, I'm going to uh, quickly pop into another uh, window here. So if you get the pods, um, say we, we care about this guy has this IP address. Mm -hmm. Um, I just do IP route, right? Yeah. So traffic to that pod goes through this interface. Yeah, the 25 one. All right, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was interested to see if you knew a way that I didn't know if that's the same way I would have done it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think that's the best way, unless you want to um, import that name generation function mm -hmm. into some other tool and, and do that. You, um, this is, off offhand I think you can do um, this as well mm. so calico cuddle has that name generation logic in it so you can see Ubuntu has this guy I feel like I'd, I feel like I'd seen that before but I must admit I totally forgotten it if I had yeah that's useful. yeah I just remembered it this uh, the second because um, I usually just check the routes. Yeah, it's nice that you can do that from on the node anyway. Yeah, you can do it from your Bastion host or whatever. You don't need to be. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, so cool. That that actually shows us that this first one is uh, one of those um, Ubuntu pods, um, and you can see basically this dispatch chain does exactly that. It uh, matches on the interface and sends it to a specific chain for that, um, for the policies that apply to that, mm -hmm. that pod. Mm -hmm. um, so everything coming out of this interface is going to be run through this chain. And if I find the delineation here, I can... Okay, see, so I'm seeing a calendar invite um, nope. huh. that's kind of half disappeared. Yeah, there you go. Brilliant. Nice. Thanks, yeah. For whatever reason, Ubuntu does not like it when I try to mute my notifications. It seems it does. It's, it's the same on mine. It ignores... Anyways. Yeah, I turned on my Do Not Disturb and I, I get the same thing, so it's got to be a bug, I think. Um, yeah, I, I had pretty much the same thing happen. Uh, cool. So here's where we get into the, the meat of this. Um, can we have comments here? Yeah. So this is really, um, uh, this is all of the policy applied to, oops, where was I? Okay. Uh, wanted to get the name of the pod. It was this guy, right? Yeah. Um, right here. So he's the one who can't access the front end. This is the one who cannot. Okay. Correct. Um, so you've got some, some boilerplate stuff right at the top here. Um, so this first rule is another short circuit rule for anything that we've already allowed so that you don't have to run every packet through this. Um, similarly, you drop invalid Mm -hmm. Connection state. Right. Um, we clear out all of the mark bits that, or sorry, we clear out the um, first mark bit. This is the bit that's used for uh, indicating that a policy has accepted um, uh, this packet. Mm -hmm. We, 
Luckily, I have some comments here. So we drop VXLAN packets that are originating from this workload, and we drop IP and IP packets originating in this workload. These are um, maybe non-obvious rules, but because Calico uses VXLAN and IP and IP as a cross-node um, kind of transport, mm -hmm. uh, these prevent pods from doing kind of fishy stuff that they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, I can um, see sticking extra headers on its own. Yeah, if you stick an additional VXLAN header on with the right stuff in it, you might be able to get it to um, not go over the, the tunnel and you end up with some um, spoofing capabilities. Yeah, so got it. These are security rules that nice. prevent pods from pretending to be someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and then right here is where we start uh, as it says, all of the policies that apply to this uh, this pod. It's really nice another... that you took the time, or you or, or whoever took the time to actually put the, the human readable stuff in there because it is going to help a lot. Yeah, for sure. That was most likely Sean. Um, but yeah, it's very, very useful. Um, we've got uh, this, none other set mark here. This sets the second. Uh, bit that we use, and this is um, maybe a non-obvious one. There's a there's an action in uh, Calico policy called pass, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't exist in Kubernetes policy, but it means that a policy can um, basically say, if you match this rule, pass by all of the remaining policies, yes. um, and go to um, the profiles attached to this. Profiles are sort of um, not used in uh, Kubernetes other than as a, um, they implement the default allow behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can have a policy that says, skip over the rest of these and jump right to um, the default allow. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you wanted, you could modify that profile and change its default behavior or something like that. Um, so like I said, there, it's kind of an esoteric thing, um, for like pure Kubernetes users, but, uh, it does still exist. Um, so we start the policy, we clear that bit out as well. Um, and then basically what the rest of these are is we're jumping through each, uh, each policy has its own, um, chain mm -hmm. that we execute. Um, so this is a policy. This is a policy. This is a policy. We've got what is it? Six policies applying to the egress of this. Mm -hmm. um, and after each, we have a check to see if that original mark bit that was cleared up here is now set. Right. Um, so if it is, that means the policy accepted this packet, mm -hmm. and we can we don't need to check the rest of them. Mm -hmm. So we we short circuit. Right. Cunning. Um, if it doesn't match that, we go on to the next one. Um, the second bit of cunning here is that we only execute these rules if the pass bit is still cleared. Yes. Right. You can see we're only we're we're matching on a mark here. Um, and the mark is uh, matching on this this same condition that we set at the top. So. That gives each of these policies an opportunity to set this bit uh, to one. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, we will just skip execution of the rest of these. How does that relate to the return then? Um, so, so if that, you mean, if that bit is set, we'll not return on any of these rules. Yes. And we'll actually even skip over this final rule drop if no policies past the packet. Yeah. Okay. Right. right. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I understand now. And then we get into this new um, second section of, of rules, which is um, profiles. Um, and for here, we have a profile for, um, again, kind of an esoteric implementation detail of how Calico does things, but there's a namespace profile and the service account profile um, that get executed here. Mm -hmm. And then finally, if 
um, no profiles drop, there's a hard drop at the very end if we get through all of this. Yeah, okay. All right, brilliant. So how, how can we map that? Is there, a, is there a predictable way to map the policy unique identifier there? For example, the one ending KUDI, um, K-U-D-Y. Uh, is there a way to map that back to the human readable policy name? Uh, there's, there's not really a way to, to reverse map the names here. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they are deterministically generated. So if you delete that policy and recreate it, you're going to get this string same, same identifier, again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's sort of a one way thing. I don't think you can, uh, take a look at this and say, oh, I know exactly what policy yeah. created that. Okay. Um, now if we do hop through and see what, uh, what rules are in there, this one only has two. Um, so we can try and figure out by looking at the rules, um, which which policy this is. So, um, yeah, it gets added to this. It's got a comment saying nothing useful. <laughs> um, and uh, we match here using an IP set. Yeah. So this is the name of the IP set. Right, which is also deterministic, presumably, judging by the other things. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, so we say if it matches this IP set, uh, IP and port, mm -hmm. then we mark this. We set the, uh, it's, sorry, it's kind of going to the next line because this is a long one, but um, we mark uh, that first bit, which means the policy was allowed. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. It has allowed the packet. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we hit this, which doesn't look like anything has, at least based on the counts um, taken when I, when I captured this. Um, we'll set this mark. It will pop back up to where we just were, which is up here. This mark will be set right there, and the policy will have accepted the packet. Yeah, makes sense. Brilliant. Um, Can we see those so, network sets? Uh, IP, sorry, IP sets in... Uh, yes. Here. So this is the name of the IP set. Let me just see. Let's install that. I'll just take this opportunity while we're doing that to remind people that they that we are fine with questions and they don't have to be. I mean, this is super deep stuff, obviously, but they don't have to be. Uh, um, the deepest questions in the world. If you have any question at all that's related to this stuff, we're, we're really glad to hear it. So dive in if you want to. Yeah, for sure. I have no script. I'm just there, just talking. So. Yeah, and that's the intention of it. I think it's it's the best way. Although as usual, we're gonna we we we've got so much more we could have done. I think we're gonna run out of time as we always do. It's funny. It's funny how time flies. Um, but okay, this is still this is still great stuff. So uh, ten um, twenty eight. Cool. So this is the IP set. Mm -hmm. um, you can see if you, if you pass the, the name, you get just that IP set, which is nice. You can see it's a type IP and port, which um, means it includes both IP and port information. It's mm -hmm. pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. In this case, you've got this IP and well, this IP and this port information. Um, so I think this is your allow to the API server. Yeah, that was going to be like a 6443. Uh, I don't, service I don't policy. think there's anything else running on 6443 that I'm aware of. In fact, yep. looking at that, that's one of the node IPs, I think, isn't it? Uh, I bet that it is. Uh, yep, there it is. Yeah, that's that guy. Yeah. Right there. Um, so that makes sense. Um, if we look at each of these, uh, maybe, so this is probably the second one, which is allowed to the DNS uh, service, it's going to look largely the same because it's the same type of policy, but it has a different IP set match on it. Um, if I just quickly show that. You'll see, yeah, 
same kind of thing, IP port. It has um, IP and port information for all of the cube DNS uh, service and, and points. So I should know the answer to this, but I'm going to admit that I don't. Where, where are IP sets stored as a data structure? If um, Where do they actually... So what is IP set actually querying? Um, it's a uh, kernel construct. Um, I don't know the kernel details super well, to be mm, honest. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I just assumed, I, I wasn't sure if the answer, I assumed the answer would be in the kernel somewhere, but I wasn't I wasn't 100% yeah. sure. I thought if I don't know, then probably what people watching might not know either, so. Yeah. Cool. Uh, um, so if we hop back up to all the policy applied to this guy, mm -hmm. um, maybe we'll find one of these other, I think they're all going to look kind of similar because they're all uh, network sets are also implemented. Um, but what, what you might be interested to see here is that each policy has a chain, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so like, for example, here's another rule that jumps to that chain, right? So this is another from workload rule, but from a different workload. This is the one with the uh, uh, CB3 interface as opposed to the 2.5B yeah, yeah. interface. Got it. Um, but because this policy it's applies the to same it, policy, yeah. we the can same chain, I mean. the same chain again. Yeah, that's good. Um, so we're not actually duplicating these rules for every um, workload that that it applies to the only thing that gets duplicated is this jump and accept um boilerplate here so on the on the point you made about the deterministic stuff that presumably means that when uh, well hang on who actually which process actually puts these um entries in here in the first place uh so it's the the process is felix yeah okay that's um, what I was... which is that's a what process within the calico node pod um, so when Felix, if Felix has to restart for some reason, does it does it go through and check that what what is here matches its expectations, or does it just pick up where it left off? It actually does that um, periodically, even without right. restarting. Yeah. Um, so it will. Uh, it has a, a refresh period where it it checks that uh, everything looks right. It reads in um, the current set of rules and does a diff and, and figures out what changes it needs to make mm, based nice. on um, its internal calculation. Mm. Cool, brilliant. That must have been very satisfying when you first saw that working. Uh, how long would that, that would have been seven or eight years, something like that, or is... Oh, a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I mean, things have changed quite a bit since then, but uh, I mean, Felix was originally written in Python, for example, so... Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you count that, then yeah, definitely seven, seven years or so would be my guess. Yeah, and I imagine some of the um, the optimization stuff that you're showing is more recent, presumably. Yeah, some some of that is is old. Some of it is new. I mean, obviously the service policy stuff is is brand new, but it's implemented using the same like battle tested logic and. Uh, rendered into the same sort of IP tables rules as the rest of our, our data model. So I'm glad you mentioned um, that. So what what we've shown there is um, is just egress policy, but um, we've only got about five minutes left. Um, I don't know if you want to take the time to try and to dig into one of the service or selector or ingress uh, policies, or if you think we're too tight on time and we won't be able to do it justice, uh, whichever way um, you'd like to you could... play it, really. I could uh, show that very quickly. Yeah, I'd, I'd um, say go for that, yeah. So, so like, as we were just looking at, we were looking at all these Kali from workload um, chains. The obvious corollary to that is Kali to workload mm -hmm. with the TW mm -hmm. instead. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you can see it really just mirrors exactly what we were looking at. There's this to workload. Um, dispatch uh, oops, uh, section like so. Mm -hmm. It looks exactly the same as the other, except that instead of in this interface, it's out this interface. Yeah. It does the same sort of tree building 
based on prefixes. Um, <clears throat> so we can look at this guy, which is the two workload policies for the same pod we were just looking at, the 25B interface. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be all of these. Like so. Um, we didn't really have uh, much policy on there, right? Um, but you can see this should all look pretty familiar based on that. We've got the same contract except packets up here. Um, drop, clear the accept mark, clear the pass mark again. Um, in this case, it looks like there's only a single policy that's applying to this on ingress. Start of policies, here's your policy chain, mm -hmm. return if the policy accepted, and then drop if no policy is pa uh, passed it. Um, so we can look at, um, actually, let's do that. Look at the rules in this guy. Um, this looks to be a default allow of some sort. Um, there's no match criteria. We just automatically set this to allow. Right. Um, so there's some rule in a policy. Uh, I don't remember exactly what policies that you applied, but one of them has a, an allow all rule in it mm -hmm. that's applying to this guy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what that rule is. Um, and you can see here, we don't see any packet counts on this because the cluster has been up a little bit. So the, um, we've already accepted this and created a um, established connection, which is why, uh, again, we can short circuit all of these rules for you know packet two through n. I'd love to create a tool that um, took this output and rendered the um, unique identifiers back to the readable names. Um, I might be within yeah. my might be within my skill set actually uh, if I can just find the time. Yeah, it's um, a little bit of a reverse Felix. Cool. Um, all right, well, we're, oh my gosh, we're, 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 we've got a I couple know, of minutes. Really fast. I know, it's shocking how quick it does. All I was right, well, expecting to get through quite a bit more. Yeah, me, me too, actually. But we we, sh we really should learn from this because I've, I've done this, you know, quite a few times now and every time we always run out of time. So it's fine. Well, um, what we'll do is we'll see what the engagement is with the recording and see if people are finding it useful. Um, if they are, um, then we can... I mean, I'm, I'm sure they will because I, I did, but if, if lots of people would like to see it, um, then we can see if we can schedule them some extra time to, to revisit the last part. We, we, know, we know now um, what that will take. Um, so I guess we'll just leave it there for today. Um, the next Calico Live is going to be uh, Nathan Skribzak, from, uh, who's an R&D engineer at uh, Cisco. Um, he's going to be joining me to talk about uh, the VPP data plane and specifically about using it with uh, Memif. And, and the benefits of doing so. So that should be really, really interesting. Um, so it won't be Casey next time, um, but if we do decide to come back to this stuff, then um, then then I'm sure um, uh, you, be, you can help Casey. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right, uh, as, as always, thanks so much for doing that. Um, and we may not have finished everything, but I, I learned a few things, so I'm confident that other people did. Um, so th thanks so much, and uh, I'll talk to you later on. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me, Chris. Take care. Uh... A lot of fun. Yeah. Take care.